talk Bug me, good in ye Me been did on this country Long time before Lord Rusty All about land belonging to we Poor bug me, good in ye Poor bugger black fella this country Long time work, no wages we Work for good old Lord Vesti Little bit plow, to guarantee For good in ye from Lord Vesti Our poor bugger me Oh, into the bunting all the women Not a bring into young of We had a Monday all a poor bugger me For the good in ye On August the 9th, 1966 In the remote area of the Northern Territory of Australia the Gurindji tribe of Aborigines went on strike and walked off the Wave Hill cattle station owned by Lord Vesti's family. The stockmen headed towards the dry bed of the Victoria River. They took with them their women and children, their dogs and all they possessed after their and their fathers' 78 years of labour. The news filtered through to the coastal cities thousands of miles away where they were surprised that the black man had walked away and shocked by the reasons he gave. White Australians could not have known that one small tribe was about to confront them and that this simple action would become a watershed of race relations in Australia. Wave Hill was far away, but a few did want to know. One of these was Marxist writer Frank Hardy, who'd crossed the vast continent from Sydney many times. In March 1973, we went with him to tell the Gurindji story. Well, this is Captain Major speaking. Our Gurindji reckon we were slaving long enough for the white men, ever since we were children. Now we try our best. We took the strike. I think we made a bit better for ourselves. I think we're happy. And uh, our boss is here, Lingari, Pinchin. He's happy this morning. Praying out here now, visit us again, our friends from Sydney and few visitors from London, they come here. And we're very pleased to see them people come here. We're very pleased. What a wonderful friend they are. Now, one day I'm in Sydney and the telephone ring and this fellow speaking from London. And he said, I want to make a film about Aborigine. Well, I said, Gurindji been taking land off Lord Vesti and been living at Waddy Creek. Maybe they're the one. And that mob decide to fly out on the aeroplane, all these fellas, and make the story. How you walked off Wayville Station, came to the Victoria River bed, then to Welfare, and then move over to Waddy Creek. Then, later on, he wants to tell the story, how Gurindji were before Vesti come here at all, a long time ago. So, the thing that happened before, we make them happen again, with the camera here, say the same word, and they make the story and put him together in one big film, and they show him in England on the television, maybe in America, and that Lord Vesti been living in England, he switch on his television one night later on, and he say that bloody Gurindji mob again, I can't get rid of them, there they are again on the television. <laughs> Of course, the Gringi had always believed the land belonged to them. But the white man built windmills, his cattle polluted their water holes and ravaged their hunting grounds. So the Gringi were forced to work for handouts. Flour, sugar, tea, that sort of thing. The authorities made it slave labour by making the Aborigines wards of the state, so-called. So the Aborigines working on Wave Hill cattle station couldn't leave. In the early days of Wave Hill and elsewhere, they could be forcibly brought back with chains around their necks because they had been made protected wards of the state. A virtual doomsday book of all Aborigines in the Northern Territory was produced. And after the 1953 Wards Employment Act, $5 a week was set as the money paid, plus this keep I mentioned and not one employer was ever prosecuted for a breach of that act in the 13 years between 1953 and 1966. Yet in most details, most employers broke most provisions of that law. So that here in Wave Hill you had the police station there, the welfare officer there, and Vesti's cattle station there. And the police station and the welfare officer existed 
to keep the Aborigines working for vestiges. It was as simple as that. There was no other purpose for them to be in this area. In the Aboriginal languages throughout the Northern Territory, the policeman, the name for policeman is man with the chains. The Aboriginal word means man with the chain. I remember I used to work on a station for seven days a week. Oh, it was a real shocking life at that time. Because we used to work from morning till sundown. We used to have bread and salt beef three times a day, like breakfast, dinner, supper. And we used to brand cattle, master cattle, bush cattle, bring them in into the station, brand them. It was a real terrible life at that time, shocking conditions. Such as acute bronchial infection, malnutrition, prenatal and postnatal deformities, trachoma infected ears, partial and full deafness from fly bone infection, berry berry rickets and venereal disease. <laughs> It's difficult for anyone who hasn't studied a map or travelled the area to appreciate the position of Lord Vestey's companies. 35,000 square miles is rented by Vestey's in the north of Australia. In Wave Hill alone, they rent from the Australian government 6,000 square miles. Until 1954, they were paying 10 cents per square mile per year for the property, which was, of course, Gurindji tribal land. After 1954, the rental was raised to the exorbitant figure of 50 cents per square mile. And paying the Aborigines virtually no money, it was the most profitable enterprise you could possibly imagine. And the government also paid the station owners money every year for the upkeep of the Aborigines. So it became as profitable to run Aborigines on your property as to run cattle. And this was known as nigger farming. So you had cattle farming and nigger farming, and this was openly, it was jokes all over the pubs in Catherine to this day. That's been put a stop to now, of course. And this money, of course, never in any form found its way into the pockets of the Aborigines. The other one was the pensions were paid into the station's account for the old people and they threw them a few tins of jam. <laughs> Truly, as I stand here, part of nigger farming. The other thing was the company store. As the $5 a week was introduced, they had to find some way of not giving this to the poor old Aborigines, so they give him a few goods from the company store, and when he came for his pay, he put his thumb mark and they said, you've got no money. You owe us money because you, your wife bought a couple of tins of jam and a pound of tea from the store. So they walked away from the labour without money and the houses without floors, from the food thrown in the dust at their feet. They must have known that hardly a white man would care a damn, but they had faith in their tribal elder, Vincent Lingiari, he couldn't read, but he understood the words of Dexter Daniels, the only black man employed by the white trade unions. There were rumours all over Darwin, from white and black alike, that the Aborigines were restless throughout the Territory. And there was a statement in the newspaper by Dexter that he would call them out all over the Territory that he thought they were ready. He talked to many of them. I met Frank Hardy in 1966. And I mentioned, I told Frank Hardy about I had a talk to old Vincent about this Wayville crowd at Wayville Station. Old Tommy Vincent told me that they're not getting any any proper wages and they're getting rations. He knew, for example, that the Wayville stockmen were ready to walk out and the other stations in this area, that he had talked to them for months, but that the leader of the union, a right-wing union official named Paddy Carroll, had said, no more, that's bad enough. How are we gonna feed that mob down there? They're two and 300 mile away. Forget it, don't wanna know. They're not members of the union, etc. So this was why Dexter was so frustrated and he was looking around for some allies. So he came to see me and I at first was very reluctant to get involved. I was really scared at that time. I thought I was gonna get shot by some of the, the manager of the station. So he took rations and a rifle and a plan of action to, to call in on the stations and simply to put the final seal on what he said was a reality, that the stockmen were ready to walk out everywhere. In 
It's very difficult for anyone who wasn't in Australia at the time to realise what a sensation that simple action caused. It was debated in Parliament with the greatest bitterness. Country Party and Liberal Party members even cried, outside influence, communist plot. But the Gringy had acted on their own initiative. And whatever happens, race relations in Australia will never be the same again. Movements have developed all over the country, sparked off by what happened here. And this is when I first realised that the strike was about a culture, a lifestyle. The white employees on Wayville Station benefited from the strike a new homestead and stockman's quarters. I've often wondered if the Gringy understood the comings and goings on the airstrip. Who comes here and why? And how could black men who've never seen the sea imagine an employer who lived 15,000 miles away beyond two oceans? Or the workings of the business political complex? Or what power and tradition lies behind the word vesti? In 1969, a Melbourne University researcher employed by the Meat Industry Union of Australia managed to compile a list of companies constituting the bulk of the Vesti group at that time. But no black man at Wavehill can understand those names, even if a list were to pass before his eye. Nor could many white shareholders of those companies scattered throughout the world recognise a Gurindji were he to pass him in the street. And it's one of the ironies of the complex world that many a sympathiser of the Gringy's plight may have lurked behind this unread list. Neither the pioneers who came on foot in search of new pastures, nor the financiers who came in aeroplanes decades later could meet the black man on equal terms or with mutual respect. The white man lived by a Christian ethic long since adapted to trade and profit. He taught the black man to muster cattle. He did not teach him to read or write. He tried to teach him his 2,000 year old religion, but made not one convert amongst the Gringy in 80 years. The Gringy had a religion of their own, extending back 30,000 years, and they continued to practice it. Secretly to avoid the white man's scorn, all the more ardently because of the humiliations they and their women had suffered. Their religion had its own ritual dances and songs in which they became one with their ancestral heroes, back to the ancient dream time and forward into infinity, with which they sought to control the weather, the supply of food and the well-being of the tribe. The main place of the Gurindji dreaming is Seal Gorge. They went there each year during the rainy season to reenact the deeds of their heroic ancestors. The Aborigines have their own sacred mythology to explain the creation of the world. Its basis is the dreaming, a time long ago when heroes and heroines inhabited the earth and created all of nature and the spirits of all living creatures. So Seal Gorge is a sacred place, a source of life from the eternal dreaming. Religious rituals are performed there to bring into operation the power of the gorge to create new life, new piccaninnies, new animals and new growth to the sun-drenched land. At Seal Gorge, the dead watch over the living and the living mourn for the dead seeking solace for the loss of loved ones who have left them and gone to the dreaming. 
The living mourn for the dead in a ceremony called pakamani, which means release from sorrow. The totems of the various kinship groups of the tribe are painted on the gorge walls and the bones of the dead are kept in caves. For the heroes of the dream time are sometimes animal, sometimes human. The spirit beings of the dreaming have left reserves of the essence of life in trees, rocks, waterholes, gorges and caves upon which the living can draw. At Seal Gorge, the young men are initiated into the secrets of the dreaming to have faith as the old men have faith forever and ever. Cave paintings of the tribal totems and the living generation of Gurindji dancers performing the same rituals as their ancestors all possess miraculous powers. All are enshrined in mythology and associated with the natural environment. The striking Gurindji sat on the dry bed of the Victoria River and waited. They ran out of food, but still they waited. The cattle mustering season was at its height. The Vesti homestead sent an offer of beef to feed the whole tribe, if the stockman would return to work. But the Gringi refused. With money raised in the south, we managed to speed rations to them. Without fuss or jostling, they calmly shared the food out, equally amongst the kinship groups in which they were living. Days passed into weeks and weeks into months, and the Gringy harboured and shared their food. It was an awe-inspiring spectacle. I was sad for them until I remembered the appalling situation from which they had fled. I had read a book about Australia called The Lucky Country and I couldn't help thinking, if Australia is the lucky country, the Aborigines must be the unluckiest people in the world. The unlucky Australians. <coughs> One time ago before I was born, that was early day, my grandfather and great-grandmother carried out in a bush. That was the uh, early day, many, many years ago. No white men was in this country. They used to go out and get food. Now one day they went to hunt, trying to find the emu track. They ran into this brush track, cow and calf, little calf and a cow. While they Joe wasn't realised what he was. Well, what made you saying is, is the story of how the Aborigine first saw cattle. It's a very funny story. One day, his grandfather, many Aborigine, they go out trying to hunt kangaroo and emu, such animals they had before. <clears throat> they found a track of a cow and a calf, which had been brought here by the first white men to run cattle in this area at Wave Hill. Jimmy Gale and... Buddy. Pat, Buddy Gale and, and Tommy. Tommy Gale. That's right, Major. So they come to a water hole and there was the cow and the calf. They've been following the tracks with the split hoof. Now they went round. They had a good look at him. They wouldn't kill him or anything. They had a, just got a good look at him, what he was. Someone was trying to get a word out of him. They asked the old bullock. 
They say, good day, where you come from? They ask him all sorts of questions and all cowards just look around and shook his head, I don't know. Oh. So they go back, they tell them all at the camp, we can see something up there. They've got four legs, maybe a human being, big horn on his head, split who? Something very strange. Anyway, next day, Major reckon, they go out again and they see big mob of tracks of these uh, cattle. So they go again, find them there. How are you? We don't have a good look. We don't want to kill you. So then they said, oh, well, one of these cattle started to attack them. That right, Major? Yeah. yeah. He took after one. He said, whoa, whoa, no. <laughs> Knock him over. You see, that means that bullock gave him a cheek and this bullock got to spear him, see? Kill him with a spear now. All right, they had to cut him down. They got him up for beef. So unknown to the Aborigines, according to Major's story, Paddy Gale and Tommy Gale, these two white blokes, came here to start the station. They see all these uh, cattle carcasses and, uh, where the Aborigines have been eating the beef. So they go to Sydney and they get a team of men. And the Aborigines couldn't make out what they were going crook about because they eat anything that walked around here. So they bring this mob up here <clears throat> and the Aborigines come with spears behind the bushes and this is camel drivers, maybe Afghans. Anyway, the, the team driver, he's got a bald head, see? And then Paddy Gale had a bald head, Tommy Gale had a bald head, so they think they've got some bald headed tribe, so they drop their spears, <laughs> Major and they run back. That funny mob, no, this mob got, the other mob had four legs and split hoof, this mob all got no air. So, of course, they don't realise it. It's only just up the, a few mile up the road, what they call Black Fella Knob. What's yeah, the uh, Gringy can... name? What's the Gringy name? Maka. Maka. You can so, get from here, so they go up there, uh, uh, Major's gr famous grandfather, Jarambuck. Yeah, Jarambuck. That right word, Jarambuck. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great fighter, he was a great warrior. They seen this mob of soldiers, all the white men, come up with a rifle. While they were trying to put up a fight, they did put up a fight. My old grandfather, he did. He got five, five white men. Just on his hand, because... That's the only weapon he had, spear. He had to dry his best. He got the five men, five white men, with his spear. Get him, get him down off the horse and kill him. Then he put his hand up. That is why put him, put him in jail with something say to shot him. Shot him through the heart, killed him. So Paddy Gale and Tommy Gale then thought, well, now we want this Aboriginal mob to work for us to hunt the cattle, see? So they become friendly. So they dress up as Aborigines, they get all the hair and all the paint and put hats on them. They come up to see them gorgeous, pretend to be Aborigines. So they work for them. So the Aborigines friendly people they talk. And that's how they started to work on Wavemill Station, which later on, Vesties bought off Tommy Go and Paddy Go. In November 1966, the Gurindji were driven from the river by torrential rain and moved to higher ground behind the welfare settlement. They built themselves tin huts, no better or worse than those they had lived in before the strike. The new year 1967 came and the fierce sun dried out the land. The Gringy had survived the wet season. Ironically, the welfare officer at Wave Hill just then was a remarkable eccentric named Bill Jeffries. For a time, he fed the Gringy on government food but the politicians got onto him, and soon he was attacked in Parliament and threatened with the sack. It was clear by then that a short-lived interest in the South from a few unions, a few do-gooding people, a few thousand dollars, and white Australia wanted to forget. Now, why did Vesties, and not only Vesties, but the other cattle station owners, treat the Aborigines as they did? Perhaps mainly because they didn't understand that the Aborigines had a culture, a way of life. They didn't know that they went over to Seal Gorge to dance the corroborees and perform the ceremonies. They didn't understand that the Aborigines lived in a communal way. Each person had his obligation. No one had to tell him. I learnt that from the Gringy. Vincent Lingari told me, we have no policemen, we have no jury, we have no courtroom, no judges. Everybody knows what they have to do.
Good day. Good day. My name is Fincher. Oh, yeah? What's your name? Frank Addy. Oh, yeah. Pleased to meet you, mate. Pleased to meet you, too, Fincher. Yeah. How are you going? All right? All right. Good. We want that best of my crew wife. Well, get away from here. We don't want it. Best him up here. This is our country. But Pincher, me and Dexter Daniels and all that union mob, we thought this strike at Wayville Station was about the bad wages, only five dollar, bad condition, bad houses. What if they make the wages right over there? Would you go back and work at Wayville if they made wages right and the conditions better? We want the best man go back where he come from. This is a good in your yard. All over, all over place, all over Australia. All over. I've been right around here, all good in the country. We want to work this place, same as, same as the white European. We want to work this place outside. Well, I, I don't know, Pincher, I've been here two weeks and I thought you might have been striking for better wages condition. Now you say you want that all the Gurindji land back to work yourself. Is that what you tell me? Yeah. Well, that been the police station down there, the copper shop, and that been the welfare <coughs> settlement. Yeah. Now, Waddy Creek comes out here and it says here Gile Creek. That right, a Gill Creek, that? Yeah. Gill Creek? Yeah. What do you call him? Gill Creek. Gill Creek. What about... Uh, Poison Creek Boar. What you call him in uh, in Gorinji? Uh, Mingarangana. Mingarana. Mingarangana. Uh, Mingarangana. Yeah. The Gringi convinced me that the strike was really about land. They asked me to apply to get their tribal land back. All right. Up here we got Mount Williams. Yeah. Does that come into Gorinji country? <coughs> no. no. What about um, what about Campfield itself? That Campfield part. Mount Wollaston? No. No? Well, he must come. What, what about Bullock Creek? Bullock Creek? Yeah, that's where yeah. going. All well, right, now we come over here, the Sandstone Waterhole, you know that yeah, one? Yeah. yeah. What about that? Which one? Sandstone Waterhole, you know him? You mean on the map here, maybe some welfare mob put him on. He's not done exist at all. <laughs> well, we seem to be pretty right now, you Gurindji mob, over that way at <coughs> Camfield and down the bottom. Yeah. Now, up the top here, we've got Bill Yanara, Yanari Hill, you know him? Is he in Gurindji country, Major? Yeah, he's on Gurindji. No, I see, okay. Well, now, what about uh, <coughs> Mount Baines? Mount Baines, not in. Not in, all right. Well, then we come down from Bill Yanara this way to Gill Creek and Waddy Creek. Yeah. All right, well, you blokes decide that you want to get this land back. Yeah. So that yeah. seems to be where that land, Gurindji country, border. Yeah. Now, the proper way, I've been thinking last night, the proper way to do it is to send that with a letter to Canberra to that Governor-General. What do you do with his living? The Governor-General? Yeah. Well, he, uh, he's, uh, he's the Canberra boss. What's the good? Send him a letter. Well, uh, he, he, you've got to send it to him because he... I'll try and explain that. He, it's a bit, it's a, this is how the white mob run it in Canberra. No. You send a letter to the Governor-General, then he'll send him to Minister. You know that Minister Barnes, that fellow been Minister Territory? Then that mob, the Liberal Party government mob, they'll meet about him and they'll send you a letter back. Well, I, I'm a bit inclined to agree with you, Major, that it's not much you send it to him, but that's the proper way to do it. So, it, yeah. you see, you have to do in the proper channel. What do you think about that, Donald? Yeah, that's all right, yeah. All right with you? Yeah. Major, what do you yeah. think? To yeah. send him there? <coughs> send him a letter. And, Tom, what do you think? I want to do this the right way. I've been thinking it's the right way. I don't want to do it at all unless you're Gringy Mob Sure, this is a big job. What's your word on that, Tom? Well, you got the map right now, and you can send some messages on the map to the Governor General and them other big heads down there in the Canberra Mob. You can tell him. And I don't want no message come back anyhow. And I'm going tomorrow morning uh, up to the Wally Creek. And Wally Creek and uh, all my dreaming country there, and I'm going to stay right there.
It was clear that this whole tribe, men, women and children, had determined to move to Watty Creek near Seal Gorge. Between the creek, which has a permanent spring, up to Seal Gorge, that's where the sacred places are. But I thought, I can't encourage this. It's a dangerous plan. They might be arrested or shot at. But they said, no, tomorrow morning we're going. We'll move in and take Waddy Creek, start fencing it in and building houses. Wadi Creek was the promised land, and like the ancient tribes of Israel crossing the Red Sea, the Gurindji crossed Wadi Creek. Bill Jeffrey, the welfare officer, I know he wouldn't mind me telling this now, he took barbed wire, flour, tools, wire cutters, strainers, axes, saws, everything they would need from the welfare store, and he just chucked them over the fence. And the Aborigines just happened to find them there. When the Gringy had crept away like hunters in the Piccaninny dawn, they appeared to have no doubts, but I had plenty. They were going to trespass, to illegally build dwellings by a watering place, to steal land from Lord Vesty. But the Gringy had learned many things in the eight months of the Wavehill siege. Above all, they learned that white Australian land never passes to the meek, so they marched to build a village on the banks of Wattie Creek. The Gringy decided they wouldn't wait for any government to give them land and they would never go back to work as a tribe at Wave Hill Cattle Station. If they weren't going to be given the land, they would take it. We're going to take it back, they said. We're not waiting for anybody. We will take back our land a little bit at a time. Now you grave out that land, Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I suppose I really thought, it's nearly seven years ago now, when I did go back eventually to Sydney, that they wouldn't last very long here. They had one primitive building. The whole tribe moved here. They were subjected to intimidation, pressure and physical threats, including rumours deliberately spread that the government was going to bomb Waddy Creek, which the women here believed including cutting blind men off the pension, including paying no dole to unemployed men and no social services, including refusing to bring the children to and from the school. You couldn't name the continual pressure that was put on these people. Yet I found them happy at this time and apparently confident. As a tribe, they had escaped the commanding hand of Vestes and the paternal hand of welfare and they seemed to hope ultimately to become independent of their friends from the south. They had staked their claim on history. They had always belonged to Waddy Creek. Now Waddy Creek belonged to them. They had won back their self-respect and their identity. If they waited at Waddy Creek, the children could grow up speaking their own language and learning the ancient tribal ways. If they waited at Waddy Creek, they might escape the corrupting power of the white man's ways, which was destroying their brothers who dwelt on the fringes of the cities and towns all over the land. If they waited at Waddy Creek, Australia might yet be shamed into recognising their land claim. The land had never ceased to be their religion. If they waited at Waddy Creek, the land might again sustain them.
Not the least of the pressure that was put on the Gringy was the building of houses over at the welfare settlement five miles away. Something like $3 million was spent by the government to build that village and equip it and supply every facility, including electricity. With the idea that the Gringy would be inveigled to move out of Warry Creek and into the new houses. It was very strange. The Gringy accepted work building the houses, Major and others worked there, to get money for Waddy Creek. But when the houses were finished, they refused to live in them. Now, the Gringy want modern houses here. There's a plan that exists for a village here based on their kinship groupings. Architects plan. They're very keen to get every modern facility, including good houses. But on principle, they wouldn't move back to the settlement because their destiny had been decided by white men for so long by the welfare officer, the policeman, the station manager, the parson, that they don't want any more. They, they here decide their own destiny. When they refused to move into those houses, I think everybody knew, including the government, that the Gringy were never going to leave Waddy Creek. The only way they could, could have got them out after that was by force. They restored the mores of tribal life, the kinship group system of living. All that's needed now is for the government to return to them the land which is rightly theirs. And after 200 years of occupation of Australia and 80 years here, pay compensation in the form of capital backing. In some areas where the government has made some tentative moves to grant land rights to Aborigines, they've given a few individual Aborigines a bit of land. But you see, that wouldn't work with the Gringy, for they're a tribal group. It's got to be for the whole tribe and all the tribal land. They can organise the details themselves. The Gurindji were looking ahead. While they waited at Waddy Creek, they fenced in land and built a stockade for horses with money donated by the Waterside Workers' Federation. Without much equipment, capital or skills, the Gringy worked with a will to make the impossible dream come true. Trade unions, citizens committees and students from the south assisted the Gringy to do their own thing. During the six years between, they paid the wage of a white assistant who could read their mail and repair their vehicles. One of these was David Quinn. Sustained only by an instinct for survival, they carried on their apparently harmless labours. Yet their very act of trespass and the seeming hopelessness of their task generated such public agitation that a proposal to grant them eight square mile of land, including Waddy Creek, came before the cabinet of the Conservative Federal Government. In July 1969, the proposal was defeated without being put to the vote. The cattlemen's lobby had been busy in the corridors of power at Canberra. When partial victory was so snatched from their grasp, the Gringy carried on, but a long period of stalemate began. The authorities seemed to reason that if they isolated the Gringy, their morale must decline, their slender resources run out. and all but a few of the Gringy's friends lost interest. They came close to starvation and new pressures were applied to them. Appalled by the news, I returned to Waddy Creek and advised the Gringy to give up. Vincent Lingiari replied, no. We know how to wait and we will wait. I wrote a series of articles for the Australian newspaper revealing the Waddy Creek situation. I discussed them with Dexter Daniels. The issue was whether traditional occupancy gave an indigenous people moral or legal rights to land. If the Gurindji are defeated, I wrote, the fate of the Aborigines as landless people robbed of their birthright will be sealed. On July the 10th, 1970, 
a Save the Gurindji committee was formed in Sydney. It planned action to raise finance and impose a nationwide boycott on goods manufactured by Vesties. They bought horses with the money they had earned helping to build the houses in which they refused to live. Meanwhile, 2,000 miles away in Sydney, on July 16, 1970, a huge demonstration of Aborigines and whites marched on Vestey's head office. After violent clashes with the police, 47 people were arrested. At Wadi Creek, Vincent Lingyari said, that good idea. We fight Vesti here, and you mob in the south fight them there. <laughs> While the Gringy broke in young horses at Wadi Creek to work the land, as if it had been or would be returned to them, White Australia tried to find a formula to contain the problem they posed. The government said, we can't grant land to the Gringy because Vesti's lease has been renewed until the year 2004. And Vesti said, we are willing to give up part of the land, but the government won't let us. The government and Vesti seem to be hiding behind each other's skirts. Wee, wee. Good boy. Good boy. And pull him. He got him. The Gringy had their vehicles repaired by David Quinn and Peter Riley. Peter was the first tribal member to be trained under their plan to acquire white man's skills. The Gringy were preparing to operate a cattle station for all the world as if they owned the land. The Gringy became a symbol and an example to be followed. Claims for the return of tribal territory reached Canberra from other groups. Towards the end of 1971, Mr Justice Blackburn ruled that the concept of land rights by virtue of traditional occupancy was unconstitutional. If the Aborigines wanted land, they must buy or lease it, just as a white man must. The Gringy asked, what will we pay for the land with? We worked for Vesties for flour, sugar and tea. Maybe that's the proper fee. The Gringy and their supporters began to place their hopes in a change of government. In December 1972, the Labor Party came to office and promised land rights to Aborigines, including the Gurindji. Impatient after their long preparations, the Gurindji became the victim of a catch-22. They were ready to muster unbranded cattle, but you can't muster cattle without a brand, and a brand can't be issued unless you have legal tenure to land. Gurindji mob ready, they got horses but they've got to have brand before they can sell any cattle. Yeah. like to see the brand, you push the brand straight out. If you come out and, I'm, and I'll start what I can do with the cattle, start branding, if I can get the brand. It's brand, like, you know, I can't go without brand. But there are brands other than those on the hides of cattle. There is the brand of freedom on men. Men who own the horses they ride. Men who are part of their landscape like the watering places, so that when one of them speaks, it is as if a tree had found words. At Wadi Creek, the past and future meet as if captured in the memory of the dreaming. Once the Gurindji walked by Wadi Creek and the land sustained them. Now he rides by Wadi Creek and believes the land will still sustain him. The mustering skills with which the white man enslaved him will now be used to escape the white man. The Gringy will muster cattle and have them trucked to the marketplace, but he will do so by cooperative effort. He has experienced the white man's lifestyle and rejected it. Not for him the pattern of boss and worker, of price and profit, of command and obedience. For the Gringy way is the tribal way. 
from each person according to his ability and the tribal obligation, to each person according to his need and the tribal resources. It was ever so, all men equal, and the beasts and the foliage one with them, and the sun rising and the sun setting, and all rendered immortal by the dreaming. When the new government at Canberra excised Waddy Creek and its immediate environs from Vesti's lease and issued a cattle brand to the Gringy, they celebrated with a corroboree. <laughs> Sing to your heart's content but delay your final celebration until the white man has kept his promise to return all the land to which you belong. I have often wondered what motivated and sustained the Gurindji during those seven perilous years at Wadi Creek. Sometimes I thought it was a smouldering hatred, lying unsuspected behind their gentle and docile nature, which found no expression in angry words or violent actions. In the end, I came to believe that it was a desire to regain their identity with themselves and the sacred land. Now they seem to have utter confidence in the future. Not for them, the scornful doubts of their enemies or the anxious queries of their friends. They believe they can create a viable economy at Wadi Creek within their ancient communal lifestyle and meet the white man as a brother on equal terms. Let no man readily say that they can't. White Australia and Western Anglo-Saxon whites everywhere and other Europeans have to learn that there is a much to be learned from that simple fact of how the Gringy survived here because there was no class division, no exploitation, no greed, no one group battening on another, no group that would betray as France was betrayed by a group when Hitler moved in. This seems to be drawing the long bow, but when the pressure of local and international capital and power was put on the Gringy, there wasn't one group that broke away and, and, and broke the front. And I think now that we can expect in this century, if this new government, uh, they'll be under enormous pressure from the pastoral groups and others not to do anything viable for the Gringy. But if they can break through that and really make a move here, we could have an experiment in the restoration, the self-propelled restoration of a primitive communal organisation of society which would be a, something that the whole world would want to study by the end of the century. I think that's why the Gurindji survived and it's why there's a lot of hope that something quite unique in the world might happen in Waddy Creek in the next 25, 28 years. <laughs> Oh, bugger me, good in ye, me been did on this country Long time before Lord Rusty, all about land belonging to we Oh, bugger me, good in ye Oh, bugger black fella this country, long time work, no wages we Work for good old Lord Rusty, little bit plow I to guarantee For good in ye, from Lord Rusty, oh, poor bugger me Oh, bugger me, Gurindji, my name Vincent Lingiari, me talk all about Gurindji, Dagarago place for we, home for we, Gurindji. But poor bugger black full of this country, government boss him talk long we, fill your house with electricity, but that wife hill for can't you see, what a creek belong to Lord Vesti, oh poor bugger me. 
poor brother black fella got in ye Suppose we buy him by country What you reckon proper fee Might be flower to guarantee From good in ye to Lord Vesey Or poor bugger me Oh, into the panting all along And not a pring into young of a We are up a Monday All a poor bugger me for a good in ye